So I just flew in from Chicago, and I gotta say, my arm is tired. It took me forever. It kept going like this. In fact, I think the only way I would have gotten here slower is if I swam, because I just go in circles. You know, back in the day, coach used to call me Finding Nemo. In fact, I think the fastest I ever swam was when I was a sperm. <laughs> Speaking of sperm, I've been missing my hand since I was pretty much conceived. I was born with what's called congenital limb deficiency. And what that is, is it just basically means that you're born missing part or all your limbs. And this happens in about one in every 2,000 live births, with upper limb abnormalities being the most common. And how this happens is that when you're about this big, the amniotic band will just wrap around something and cut it off sometimes. Or the amniotic fluid will just switch the direction it's flowing in and knock something off. So, I was blessed with this cute little guy as my stump, Mr. Nubbly here. As you can see, he makes a smiley face. Gave him that name when I was about three years old, and we've been partners in crime since day one. Growing up, I didn't have that hard of a time learning how to do things. Since I was born missing my hand, I learned how to do things at the same pace as the other kids, unlike other amputees who have to relearn how to do things, and I'm very fortunate for that. So I could do things pretty much the same as everybody else. I could tie my shoes, ride a bike, play guitar, you name it. If I set my mind to something and I decide I'm going to do it, then I do it. So when I was an infant, I had what's called a myoelectric hand, and that has diodes on either side of the stump, and it detects electrical movement from the muscles to make the hand open and close really simple. Now, this technology was wasted on me because I was an infant, and I just used it for teething purposes mostly. I had a set of body-powered prosthetics, which were essentially just a hook that was made to look like a hand with a strap that wrapped around my right shoulder. And when I moved my right shoulder, it would open and close the hook of the hand. Now, I didn't like this very much. It was uncomfortable. I could do everything better without it. And I really only wore it when I was in a play and the character needed two hands. <laughs> or I wanted to bring it to the lunchroom and smash apples. <laughs> so I stopped wearing a prosthetic completely when I was about 14, and life was good. But when I was 20, it became recommended to me that I start wearing one again, just so I could even out how I grew into my body and build a little bit more muscle symmetry on my left side and do some physical therapy. And I was bummed out about this, because I had some negative experiences with prosthetics in the past. So I started looking into some alternative options. And if you're on social media, you've probably seen some of these, some of the really cool bionic hands that people are making nowadays. Now, essentially, we're making people cyborgs now, and I think that's sweet. So a lot, how a lot of these work is that they detect electrical signals from the brain, so with a lot of them, you just have to think, and you can make the hand open and close and toggle through different hand positions. A lot of them also are controlled by smartphone apps, so you can remotely control the hand positions by toggling through different buttons and presets. Or they can detect the movement of the muscles in the stumps to do the same thing. But not only are we starting to make people cyborgs, but people are starting to trick them out personalize them, make them really cool. I'm talking smart watches in the wrists, LED lights, laser pointers, lighters, you name it. And I saw these, and I said, yo. <laughs> this is sweet. Strap me up, make me a cyborg, throw me on a hoverboard, it's 2017, and I'm gonna go fight some crime. Unfortunately, bionic hand ranges between $10,000 and $100,000. That's a lot of money. So I thought, well, I could drop out of school. I could afford it then. But then I thought, it's pretty whack that college literally costs an arm and a leg. <laughs> But, <laughs> an arm and a leg doesn't have the cost as much as college. 
because 3D printing. Ooh. <laughs> so if you don't know what a 3D printer is, a 3D printer is a device that takes an image from a computer and turns it into a three-dimensional object by stacking very thin layers of plastic on top of each other. Some 3D printers can be loaded with other materials, such as metal. Now, 3D printers are revolutionary because they allow for innovation, invention, rapid prototyping, and the decentralization of production. And when you 3D print body-powered prosthetics, you can do it for just a couple hundred dollars. So, as a student of Michigan State University, I have access to the 3D printer in the library. So, when I found out about this, hopped online, downloaded some designs, some blueprints, some codes that people have already made, and started to get to work on building my own hand. Unfortunately, I had the technology, but I didn't have all the skills necessary to complete the project. I ran into some roadblocks. For, for instance, I don't know how to use CAD, and I'm really bad at math. I only learned to count to five. <laughs> that wasn't a hand joke, by the way. I went to public school as a kid. <laughs> so, to combat this, I got into contact with Michigan State University's Resource Center for Persons with Disabilities. And they put me in contact with engineering professor Steve Blosser. Now, what he does is organizes capstone projects for engineering majors so that they can build new technologies for people with disabilities. So we organized a team of electrical engineering seniors to design and prototype the controls and the electronics within the hand. We also organized a team of alumni and undergrads to 3D print and fit the arm. Currently, we have a 3D printed bionic prototype hand powered by four sensitive resistors that we made for only just a couple hundred dollars worth of household hobby electronics. And we're almost done printing a 3D printed solid uh, physical therapy hand. And a lot of the designs and resources we've been basing ours off of were made available to us online for free through open sourcing. And what open sourcing is, it's when a software company provides a source code for a software online for free, usually through a license, so that people can download, edit, and change the software for their own projects. Now, open sourcing is really cool because it allows for people who are passionate about a project to collaboratively work on it from all around the world. Since there's so many people working on a project, there's constant updates and innovations, and it allows for businesses to interact with their customers in order to make the software better. And open sourcing was very instrumental in the development of the Linux operating system, which you've used if you've ever used Google Chrome or own an Android phone. So, let me ask you, what do you think happens when you combine open sourcing with 3D printing. You change the game. You change the game because now, if people can't afford to spend an arm and a leg on an arm and a leg, being able to go online and download and edit existing designs and print your own limb for the, just the cost of the materials is absolutely amazing. Now, People with 3D printers can steal business from the big prosthetic companies and target the part of the market that they're not utilizing. State-of-the-art prosthetics are still limited to people who can afford them, forcing amputees worldwide to either live without assistance or to wear limbs that don't fit as comfortably. Now, these 3D printed limbs, they're not as tricked out as the commercial ones, but they work and they're cheap. So, groups like Enable the Future, they're a community of people who take 3D printed limbs and ship them to people in parts of the world who would not have access to these technologies. And they, give, and they work with people who have 3D printers in order to make limbs stronger, more comfortable, more reliable, cheaper, and more efficient. If you live in a remote or underdeveloped part of the world, you can imagine how a 3D printer can have a positive impact on your community. Instead of having to wait weeks or months for a unique machine part to be shipped, having a 3D printer can save you a lot of time and money. So, with all of this in mind, let's take a look at some models of production. Typically, a manufacturer will make a product, ship the product to a market closer to the consumer, 
and then the consumer will buy the product. But with 3D printers, the consumer can be the producer, and they can produce many different things for people in their community. Now, the second model of production is just starting to apply to things like prosthetics. But as these new technologies start to catch on and more and more people have access to them, we're going to start to see the second model of production more and more frequently. We've already started to see the shift in our economy from a manufacturing-based one to more of an information-based one. And if these trends continue, we're going to have to think about business and manufacturing in a very different way. Imagine a day where you could go online, buy the code for a product, and then download it, and then print that object in your house without having to wait for shipping. I think that's really cool. So, some people think that these ideas are going to impact their lives a lot. Some people think that what's happening with prosthetics and open sourcing and 3D printers are paving the way for a new industrial revolution. It may happen in our lifetime, it may not. I don't know. Oh, there we go. I don't know. But what I do know is that enabling amputees to make their own limbs for fractions of the cost using free online resources is changing the industry and changing people's lives. Open sourcing and 3D printing aren't things that people have to think about on a daily basis. But for me, it's starting to affect my life directly. And I'm very blessed to have the people and opportunities that I do. If you're inspired by this, I ask that maybe you get involved or take these ideas and apply them to something that you're passionate about in order to help pave a better future. Thank you.